ECA stack used by millions and millions of people for decades all around the world is a thermogenic for fat burning. What's going on here? It's a combination of three constituents, ephedrine, caffeine, and aspirin. Well-known thermogenic combination since the 1970s, 80s, into the 90s. We'll talk about how it was subsequently banned. Utilized by everyone, actually, from the regular person through fitness people up into pro bodybuilders. Bodybuilders definitely use this, and we'll talk about that in the end, how I see some of the clinical applications. Definitely evidence-based support that the combination of ephedrine and caffeine increase fat loss in obese people. And there's data going back for decades uh, showing that you could lose up to about a kilogram of fat per month. Again, these are real numbers. These are real studies. And if you could lose consistently two to three, four pounds a month regularly, uh, with a sustainable diet with some kind of an agent like this that would be amazing right if it's actually not dangerous for you and we'll see about that here in the end so interestingly adding the aspirin to that combination of ephedrine and caffeine it prevents norepinephrine levels from declining so it just makes that stack of ephedrine and caffeine more sustainable and more potent it's not that it's a blood thinner. It actually affects the metabolism of this and it makes it more sustainable, keeping some of those post-metabolites active. And we'll see how that affects the actual disease states. What is ephedrine? It's a synthetic analog of ephedra. And in the class medical utility, it's a sympathomimetic, which means that it's going to hit alpha and beta receptors. It's a stimulant type drug. How do we use it medically? Pressing agent, which means if someone has low blood pressure, this is more in the hospital, it's used to get blood pressure up. Now, outside the hospital, if someone has low blood pressure and they're orthostatic, which means they're standing up, they're moving around, and they have low pressure, we can use this more chronically to keep their blood pressure up for orthostatic hypotension. Next, classically knows, bronchodilator. Remember, it's hitting the alpha and beta receptors, bronchodilation. The medication will stimulate across the board all receptors. It's not selective, so you're going to get increase in heart rate, blood pressure, and of course, there's the overlap and the spillover into the increase in cellular metabolism and slight heat generation. Stuff kind of reminds me of a little bit of a weaker DNP. What do you got going with ephedra? That's a naturally derived from a plant agent and it has very similar characteristics of the real medical ephedra. Now, let's talk about the bans and the legal aspect of this. So, because of the side effects, which we'll talk about, first off, the Fed stepped in 2003 and they banned supplement companies from including ephedra in their products and marketing for that. Number one, 2003. Then the Fed comes in in 2005 with a Methamphetamine Epidemic Act where they banned over-the-counter formulations with ephedrine and pseudoephedrine, remember, for the, you know, for the colds, for congestion, and even for the bronchodilator, primatine, and all this kind of stuff. So they banned it, not outright, they just said that they're going to make it pseudo-controlled, and this is a federal, and you'll see this when you try to buy pseudoephedrine or primatine tablets, that you have to show your license and it's behind the counter. It's not going to be open in the counters in the front where you can buy all the other cold remedies. That's amazing, isn't it? Right today, you can go out and buy that, but you're going to see that it's going to be it's quasi-controlled, although it's still over the counter. So... Why did they ban this and what happened to this medication? Well, based on the science that we talked about, stimulating the heart all comes back mainly to the heart. So you're going to get complications. 
palpitations, irregular heart rhythms can lead to, in some cases, dangerous set setups. So it's going to push someone into SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, which is classically known as a flutter and a fib. Everyone knows this stuff, right? You hear people getting this stuff, not just old people, happens in young people. And the dangerous ventricular tachycardia, VT, that's a, that could be a deadly arrhythmia and myocardial infarction. Okay, now that's the cardiac stuff. So what else happened that they saw over years, people ending up in the emergency room for this stuff? Anxiety and panic attacks and even rare psychotic episodes. And I've heard about this stuff and I've seen this stuff. Very interesting. Now, think about the anxiety, and you look over and you think about the norepinephrine. You know, so this stuff, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, these are central nervous system acting uh, agents, and they relate to your mood and your well-being. So if you're going to crank this up, and if you're inherently nervous, boom, there you go. You're going to be more nervous. Maybe you got a panic attack. Again, rare stuff. This is definitely rare stuff. What's the mechanism of action for how it can really kill people and ending up with the cardiac complications? Think about it, common sense. If you have unstable plaque in your artery, if you're a man, you're in your 50s, 40s, maybe rare guy in the 30s, you got bad family history, the cholesterol, you have unstable plaque in one of your coronary arteries. And then you use this drug, pressure goes up, there's complications that are going to go on. You destabilize that plaque. You get a thrombus. Boom! That's myocardial infarction. It's a heart attack. It does happen. It's just what setup do you have? Are you set up? Are you predestined and susceptible to this? Next, if you have a potential for an arrhythmia, a supraventricular arrhythmia, which is the common stuff that people hear about, that typically is not deadly, a fib and a flutter, not just old people, guys. Young people have it with different genetics, and if you take these drugs, they can push that and bring that out. Thresholds come down. So you can end up with SVT. That's what I've seen in the ER for years working in there with people coming in with just too much caffeine, not to mention this stuff. So you come in, palpitations turn to worse palpitations. You're in a regular rhythm. Hopefully it's just SVT, it's non-sustained, and you're okay, and we can flush the stuff out, and you're monitored, and you go home. Otherwise, what if you have genetics for uh, a dangerous ventricular rhythm? I see this stuff. Forget the steroids for today. We're talking about non-steroid stuff that are performance-enhancing drugs. So VT, can you run and can you run uh, unsustained or, or non-sustained VT, which this is, this is the cardiac. This is how you see those rare cases, although rare, of course rare. You see a young person using these drugs and ending up collapsing, that sudden cardiac death, most commonly it's going to be an arrhythmia, a severe, a deadly ventricular arrhythmia, straight up. Okay, last piece, the psychiatric component. If you're an anxious person, if you have a baseline where you're a little bit anxious, people have anxiety, you take this drug, forget about it. You're going to be definitely more anxious. That's the limiting standpoint to this drug for most people clinically that I've heard. And can it go to panic attacks? Hopefully you're in the ER or you end up in the ER and you're safe and that panic attack is just a panic attack. But you know what they're going to check for? They're going to do EKG. They're going to look at your heart. They're going to focus on that. Hopefully it's not a heart attack. Hopefully it's not a dangerous arrhythmia. But so many times a person ends up, wow, they have some palpitations and it was SVT or hopefully not a dangerous VT that is potentially very, very dangerous, and they have to keep that person in the hospital and stabilize them. So how do I see it used? You know, these combinations are basically home-brewed. You people go out and buy these individual pieces from the pharmacy in limited supplies, or they buy it online, and they take different uh, levels of it based on bro science and how much they, they want. Who uses it? Definitely cutting agent, and it just works. It just, it does work. I, I don't think it's something that I would recommend uh, because it's not sustainable, and potentially dangerous, and it's not sustainable. So it's going to work while you're on it. It's not going to work long term. You come off it, you're going to lose the effects. Bodybuilders use it. It brings up DNP, and you can see my video on DNP. Brings up to mind, this is a very light, low-grade 
DNP. Remember, it's a thermogenic. It's used by regular people. Regular people before a wedding, got a wedding coming up, wanted to lose some weight, went out and got this stuff back in the day or even today. Other events. I'm going on vacation. I want to get my abs ready. I want to look great for vacation for the beach. Going down to the islands, want to look great. People take it. This is still used widely by tens of millions of people. So, do I think it's dangerous? I think the dangers are very real. There's no question that if you have any susceptibility, common sense now, for any of these cardiac issues, anxiety, it's going to potentially push you closer to the edge where you could present and manifest with one of these conditions straight up. So what do you do? Be careful. Don't consider not using it. You talk to some of the real pro fitness people, they don't live on this. They diet and exercise and, and they, they really, they, they train for this. They eat regularly, properly. They train hard. They do cardio. Again, the, these are all agents that people use. They're not going to lie and say they're not utilized. They use everything at different times. But is it really sustainable or should you just really you know, work hard and just stay in that great diet and just train the best you can and do the best you can. Um, the dangerous stuff can be avoided. Go to a doctor, please. Look at the stuff I presented. Histories and physicals, check your blood pressure. If you're a man and you're 30 years old, you should consider getting a coronary artery calcium score just to see if you have the beginning of atherosclerosis. And just be careful. Hope this really helps everyone. Thank you so much for supporting this channel.